Good afternoon. Welcome to this first session of our seminar. It's raining green. Hallelujah. Organized by the Observatory for the Development of the Globalization and uh, also a recently created Space Citizens Observatory for Green Deal financing with the collaboration of the Observatory of the Debt for Globalization. This is a seminar that's going to take place in different languages. You are probably already familiar with this kind of webinars, but just to help you with the interpretation and the languages, you can find on the lower right part of the screen an earth icon where you can click and you will have the choice of following the seminar in English, Catalan or Spanish. So that's the icon for languages of interpretation. So you've got the options of English, Catalan and Spanish. And there are other icons for questions and answers that you can also find below. And the chat where we are communicating about the contents of the webinar. I am now introducing myself in the chat. And we recommend that you will introduce yourselves too in this chat by saying your name and also writing whether you are belonging to uh, entity, any organizations. More than 70 people are connected and have joined the webinar so far. And so we will have a chat space where we can interact or we will have this conversation oral space. And then we can have a question and answer section where we can write our questions for the speakers. So this seminar organized by the Citizens Observatory for Green Deal Financing is doing a follow-up of where European financing is going in terms of financing and a broader scale where this green transition is going. We have a, we'll have a second webinar addressed to hydrogen this energetic vector that is a part of the energetic transition, and the third one on the eco-feminist perspective of the transition. This first webinar is focused on the impacts of uh, green and digital transitions in the Global South. You can split in different ways, but we can launch three ideas. The first idea is that the pandemic and the energetic crisis have been accelerators of this transition to the digital and to green, green digital transition with a very strong technical base. Uh, funds and green fund generations are a stimulus for this transition or can be understood as stimulus for this transition. This is a transition that focuses on technology. Technology is situated or located at the center with a material base that needs to be considered. In order to manufacture this technology, we need critical material that are very specifically located in the world, lithium, cobalt, nickel, rare earths that are concentrated in territories such as the lithium triangle, Bolivia, Chile, the Con Re Re Democratic Republic of Congo and other sub-Saharian countries also in China for rare earths. And in the case of Madagascar that we will be seeing today, there is exploitation of rare earths. And there's also a very strong relationship of the more climate ambition, the more extraction and the more exploitation. This is clearly seen by uh, on these scenarios that are more ambitious 
and they require a stronger material base, which means that we need to... Re Does this mean that we need to reject clean or green technologies? No, of course not. The focus of Square is to carry out um, research and the reflection of the impacts of this transition with a critical analysis addressed understanding that there is a limit to technologies as well and to reflect that if we want a just and clean transition we need to understand about the impacts that are happening beyond our borders and this is going to be the main focus of our webinar so i will just introduce our guests today we first have Joe Randri Amaro, an ecofeminist activist and defender of human rights in Madagascar, sociologist and founder of CRAADOI, a pan Africanist organization located in Madagascar. So, in the Indic Ocean, this organization is a pan African organization from Madagascar supporting the communities affected by. A Extractiving projects, even big, big scale extractiving projects in the sector of mining and agriculture. After her, we will have Pablo Solon, researcher and activist from Bolivia, and the Solon Foundation expert in the Amazonia, climate change, water, nature rights, and systemic alternatives. He was part of the woman um, led by Evo Morales with different um, posts from 2006 to 2011. From 2009 to 2011, he was ambassador of the pro-national state of Bolivia in the United Nations. Next, we'll have Maurice Carney, executive director of Friends of Congo. He has worked with the Congolese society during 25 years in the strategy for peace, dignity, and inclusion of Congolese society and civil society in its efforts to achieve peace, democracy, food sovereignty, and climate justice. He's a consultant for political leaders in the US, Canada, Latin America, Africa, and the UN, as well as for other NGOs and foundations. My, finally, Mariana Walter, political ecologist and ecological economist, member of the Regional Coordination Group of the Environmental Justice Atlas, visiting postdoctoral researcher at Pompeo Fabra University. Her research addresses resource extraction conflicts in Latin America and the Americas. So we will start with Zo Randri Amaro's presentation. Um, hello, good afternoon, Zo. We will make some questions to you. What is the situ current situation in Madagascar regarding the extraction of critical minerals in this um, framework of transi transition? And are there other social and economic factors in your country and what are the eco-feminist approaches on this issue. And the floor is yours, so. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Alphonse. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to talk to you about um, what is happening in Madagascar in relation to the critical minerals for the energy and digital transition, uh, especially in Europe. So since 2009, mining corporations from uh, Europe, China, and most recently Australia uh, have competed for the control of uh, strategic uh, reserves of rare earth in the Pasindava Peninsula, which is a global diversity hotspot located in Madagascar, where their exploitation would uh, bring about catastrophic and irreversible ecological impact, such that the country, uh, if this exploitation uh, were really going to take place, would then become uh, what we call a sacrifice zone. So uh, as we know, rare earths are part of the so-called critical raw material for the energy and digital transition in Europe, where uh, we also know that um, such critical raw material uh, will not be able to be produced domestically within the European Union, and that 
The imports of these minerals will remain essential for the energy and uh, digital transition. So at the moment, uh, European actors are not involved at the extraction, uh, extraction stage in Madagascar, but the, the European Union is expected to play a very important role at the macro policy and the higher levels of the value chain, notably through its trade agreements and uh, strategic partnerships with countries um, which have important rare earth reserves uh, like Madagascar, as planned in its trade actions for critical raw material supply that I will uh, show you uh, briefly in the next slide. Um, another policy tools um, used by the European Union uh, in this area of um, critical raw materials also include uh, investment through the Global Gateway, which is uh, the, the EU's foreign investment policy, uh, and export credits to promote investment in infrastructure um, projects that support critical raw material supply uh, so that the EU can diversify mining and uh, most crucially, uh, refining of rare earths uh, outside the or European Union. I wanted to underline uh, the refining because that is the most, um, most dangerous and destructive part of uh, processing of rare earths. So uh, here are uh, some infographics uh, about the, the the EU strategy for securing critical raw materials. If you look at the slides, uh, which should be on your left side at, at the top of, uh, of the slide, um, on the left, you can see that rare earths are listed um, there. And um, the foreseen EU trade actions include um, strategic raw material partnerships with countries with important reserves. And um, also to pursue predictable legal frameworks for trade and investment in rare earth uh, with Australia, which is one of the competitors for the control of uh, the rare earth reserves in Madagascar at the moment. Um, on the other side of the slide, on the right side, you will see what I said about the global gateway using leveraging and expanding uh, trade agreements as well as, as, well as investment agreements um, to uh, support uh, the, um, the expansion of the supply and the, the, its diversification um, for um, securing raw, critical raw materials. So what would happen if um, the European Union, Union proceeds with its, um, plan, with its plan for uh, securing um, critical uh, rare earths? It would bring about um, the ability of projects such as uh, the rare earth exploitation project in Apasendav, which will, which will um, have predictable, uh, not to say um, certain uh, disastrous environmental impacts. For example, the destruction of about 2,200 hectares of natural vegetation cover, including endemic plant species, rice fields, cash crop plantations, and areas that are needed for the livelihoods of, uh, of um, riparian communities. There will also be massive deforestation, 
the generation of an estimated 400 million tons of water uh, contaminated with um, with um, with toxic um, uh, chemical materials, as well as the production of uh, 800 million tons of toxic waste over the life of a project, if this uh, exploitation project would proceed. So um, there is also uh, a very high risk of contamination of the groundwater as well as the surface water, including the pollu pollution and the acidification of coastal waters, which would be fatal for the coral reefs that are uh, included in the, the ecosystem. Um, and um, last but not least, the production of large quantities of toxic residues. So uh, from an ecofeminist perspective, um, as you know, uh, for ecofeminists like me, um, the protection and the realization of our rights as women uh, are directly linked to the protection and uh, the respect for the rights of nature. So um, for us, we believe that the environmental impacts of the rare earth projects are very likely to turn into um, very high um, social and economic costs that will be borne mostly by, by women and their communities, and uh, that will undermine many of their fundamental human rights. Uh, in particular, women farmers in the Apacinda area derive their income from growing rice and cash crops, uh, such as vanilla, paper, coffee, and cocoa. And if uh, rare earth mining were to continue, then women farmers would suffer a vital uh, loss of income. Uh, water pollution would also drastically reduce the catches for fishermen, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, fisherwomen, of course, um, whose daily catches because of climate change has already dropped from uh, by by 50 to 60 percent between 2009 and 2022. In addition, the erosion of living standards and the loss of income for women and their families would mean that many of their children, especially girls, would no longer be able to go to school. And this clearly uh, would have a detrimental and long-term intergenerational um, impact on their education and uh, employment prospects. And um, for the economy of the region, the impact on the development of the tourism sector would be particularly disastrous given that this sector is the mainstay of the livelihoods of the vast majority of the population uh, in Apasandava, but also in the other island uh, bordering uh, the peninsula. So I will stop there um, so that um, you have time to ask for questions or to make comments. Thanks. Okay. Moltes gràcies, Jo. Sí, recollirem les preguntes i els comentaris i els comparem cap al final de, la, de les presentacions. Okay, so we'll take your questions. Thanks, Zo, for adjusting to the time and for mentioning the impact of the extraction of rare earths that don't only happen in China, but also in other territories like Madagascar that is suffering from these rare land extractions out now go on to ask some questions to Pablo Solon. So, good morning, Pablo. The questions 
Oh, aimed at learning a bit more about the situation of the lithium triangle, as it is known, especially in Bolivia. It's a geographic area that holds 25% of lithium resources for electric mobility and the digitalization of the global north. I'd also like to ask you um, whether what are the economic and financial actors and institutional actors there? And also, and I think this is more specific to Bolivia, I'd like to ask you, what is the stage of the proposal to advance in the lithium value chain? Thank you, Pablo. Thank you so much, Alphonse. I have prepared a very short presentation to try answering these questions. I'd like to make it clear that, it, uh, as it was said in the interpretation, I was part of Evo Morales' government between 20, 2006 and 2011, but since 2011, I am not part of the government, and this is because of the construction of a road through a protected area and an indigenous community in the Tiffany's region. So, moving to the topic that brings us here, lithium in Bolivia and energy transition in Europe. Well, we all know that there are vast amounts of batteries producing lithium batteries, carb batteries, that are being built in Europe and also in China using European capital. And obviously this is leading to a huge demand for lithium carbonate around the world. So what is the situation when it comes to the lithium triangle? Here we see the lithium triangle. Bolivia, Argentina and Chile hold 59% of lithium resources globally. However, when it comes to global reserves, the ones that have been tested and that can be exploited, we see that Bolivia is no longer on the list. The proportions changed here, and Chile is the country with the greatest reserves, greater than Argentina. And this is the case because even if Bolivia has 21 million reserves tons in lithium reserves, they have not yet been certified as reserves. They are only labeled as resources for the time being. So what was the formula used for the industrialization of lithium in Bolivia that has started to be implemented in 2008? Very briefly, it had these seven different features. One, there had to be sovereign ownership over the lithium resources and the salt panes, and this was concretized. Secondly, the management of any business to industrialize lithium had to be state-owned, 100% state-owned, when it came to the production of lithium carbonate and lithium hydrogen, and they could partner with foreign partners for lithium batteries and cathodic materials. This um, process couldn't just be an extraction process, but it had to bring added value for cathodic materials and batteries. And for this, they would resort to strategic foreign partners. They would be partners in the project. They wouldn't own the project. That is for the batteries and cathodic materials. This process was going to happen with a strong social participation and after consultations with the population, it had to be respectful of nature and the resources of this industrialization project had to be redistributed throughout society at large and to other economic and social sectors. So since 2008 and until today, one technology used is the solar evaporation technology, and this is done through pools where the saline solution is, evaporates until they reach a certain concentration, 
then this is transferred to a lithium carbonate plant. Around 1 billion US dollars have been invested by the state with no foreign partners. And the drama is that we are now in 2023 and there is no industrial production of lithium yet. In the year 2018 and 2019, and here is where we look at the link with European corporations, is that they tried developing a production of lithium hydroxide as well as cathodic materials with a German company called Assis System. This German corporation arrived in Bolivia. They even signed an agreement. A mixed, a joint venture was set up that was going to work with residual um, salt. Then the law was even amended uh, to enable work done with residual salt waste. But the contract was strongly criticized for the following reason. A, because it was a contract lasting 70 years, that's something that's never see, been seen before in any other country where there were lithium exploitation operations. It didn't guarantee the construction of a plant to produce from 300 to 400,000 batteries per year, as was announced. It didn't guarantee investment with capital from Athisa. It said that YLB, the nationally owned company and Athisa, they would manage loans worth $255 million. At the same time, even when Athisa held 49% of the shares and YLB had 51%, the minority stakeholder had the right to veto in the board and in the assembly the intellectual property for the technology contributed by Athisa wouldn't be transferred to YLB. Athisa was going to have exclusive rights to sell in Europe, and YLB couldn't, could only sell through Athisa. So this joint venture was going to pay zero fees to the state of Bolivia, and this contract was signed and. Uh, uh, the International State Investment Settlement, Dispute Settlement Mechanism from the International Chamber of Commerce. So this agreement was quite harmful for the state, and it was signed with a company that was unknown in the industry of lithium carbonate and battery production. And that is why in Bolivia there were huge mobilizations, and Evo Morales' government was forced to break ties and undo the decree that had led to the creation of this joint venture. In Bolivia, there was no lithium coup from uh, foreign companies. It was on the opposite. It was the social mobilization that led to the severing of this agreement. Why is this happening in the case of Bolivia? Well, because there's a lot being said about the lithium triangle, but each salt plain is different with very different features. Bolivia's salt plain is a plain where it rains a lot more than in Chile. The evaporation rate is much lower, and there are three to four times more magnesium than in Chile. So the technologies that have been used so far did not yield the expected outcome. So now we've entered into a second phase to try and extract lithium carbonate using a technology that isn't so much reliable on the salt panes. This is lithium direct extraction, and it includes many different variables that I won't go into explaining now. The current government of Luis Arce Catacora in order to extract lithium directly, has to find a way of overcoming the legal impediments that are in place from when the industrialization process was started. And here we come up with three possible scenarios. One is for lithium to be desalinated with 
partnerships with foreign companies to extract lithium directly, this would amend. For this to happen, they'd have to modify the law, current law because the law doesn't allow for foreign companies to extract lithium directly. There is another bigger danger, and that is they could grant concessions through eliminating areas of exclusive exploitation for the state. And there's another variable that would avoid this, and that would be to come up with service agreements with foreign companies for the design, construction, operation, and marketing of lithium. It's not yet clear how the process will unfold in Bolivia for the direct extraction of lithium. The government so far has selected one company, a Chinese consortium made up by the large company CATL, Brunt, and Stemok, and it would seem they will be awarding service contracts for the design, construction, operation, and marketing. Up until today, this issue is managed with no transparency at all, or very little transparency. However, the government has announced that it that by 2025, Bolivia will receive revenues worth $3.134 billion, which in theory would have been possible. But at this stage, bearing in mind that the construction of um, plants hasn't yet started, it's very unlikely. So this is the current situation. And in the next round, I will mention some of the alternatives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pablo, for giving us the details of the difficulties when it comes to moving forward with the industrialization of lithium in Bolivia and all of the institutional architecture. We can also see how different the reality actually is within the lithium triangle. We see that each salt plain has the differences, and thanks for also mentioning um, your participation in Evo Morales' government just before the conflict emerged. So after that, I would now give the floor to Maurice, and we would ask Maurice about his relationship with the DRC, what are the conflicts that have arisen in DRC due to the extraction of cobalt? I'd like to ask Maurice if there are any European actors involved, and I would like to know what do the local actors think of the cobalt mining? The floor is yours, Maurice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alphonse. Thank you for inviting us uh, to participate uh, in this uh, discussion. I think when speaking of the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, it's critical to understand uh, the structural uh, forces uh, that are at play, uh, both uh, historically and contemporarily. And we've uh, uh, identified at least three key uh, elements uh, that uh, the uh, listening audience uh, should, uh, should draw from. Uh, one, uh, deals with the, the structural history of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the manner in which it was created uh, coming out of the Berlin Conference as of 1884-1885 as an outpost for the extraction of uh, raw materials to fuel European industries. Uh, we maintain that uh, structure has not fundamentally changed uh, to this day. Uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, we saw uh, the extraction of rubber uh, in particular, and to a certain extent, ivory, fuel and uh, auto industry in the, in the West, and bicycle industry. And as a result, uh, it was uh, devastating for the Congolese population. An estimated 10 million lives were lost in a 23 year period as that extraction continued. As we saw advances in technology coming into the 20th century, uh, we see the, and the development of the atomic weapon uh, by the United States, which were ultimately dropped on Japan. Uh, the bulk of the uranium 
uh, that was used for that project uh, came out of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, some out of uh, Canada, but uh, the overwhelming majority and the, the best quality <clears throat> out of the Congo. And we fast forward to the dawn of the 21st uh, century, where we see a tremendous advances in technology uh, with the cell phones and now electric vehicles. And here again, we see the Democratic Republic of the Congo and its people paying a tremendous price uh, from 1996 uh, to 2008, the International Rescue Committee did a study that said that uh, 5.4 million Congolese lost their lives as a result of the conflict. And the conflict, uh, in part, is due uh, to the extraction of a wide range of uh, minerals. And the United Nations, in three studies from 2001 to 2002, laid out some 85 companies that were involved in the illegal exploitation of natural resources uh, uh, in the Congo. So uh, we saw a situation where a number of European com companies uh, were also uh, listed. So that uh, structural uh, system, the, really a capitalist system, uh, it's been in place where Congo served as the outpost of raw materials uh, obtained right up to this very day. And I think that's critical for understanding uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because what often happens is that we see uh, campaigns that are developed around particular minerals, whether it's, it's tin or coton, and now people are talking about cobalt. Uh, and that narrow look is usually done at the expense of uh, the broader uh, forces that are at play uh, in the country where the resources are, are being exploited, uh, where uh, it's being, they're being pilfered and the Congolese people are getting uh, pennies on the, on the dollar for that. And classic example uh, that we see today uh, where, um, for example, Grandcore, a Swiss-based company, was uh, sued uh, by uh, the United States and Great Britain uh, for corruption in the Congo uh, to the tunes of billions of, of dollars. And they serve as the, one of the major exploiters of uh, cobalt and uh, copper uh, in the Congo. And a close partner uh, of theirs, an Israeli businessman, uh, Dan Gertler, has been put on the US sanctions list uh, for uh, uh, corrupt deals um, in the Congo. And we see that uh, Congolese civil society has produced tremendous um, work on this. And they've uh, identified or shared uh, where you have a Dan Gertler, for example, who is uh, for all intents and purposes become a billionaire over dealing in uh, minerals in the, in the Congo. Uh, at the time, he had uh, established a, maybe about a decade ago a company called Nicanor. He and Benny Steinmetz, uh, who's uh, now um, in the crosshairs of the Guinean um, courts. Uh, listed a company called Nicanor, the London Alternative Investment Market, which was at the time one of the largest listing uh, to the tune of over a billion dollars uh, valuation, which at the time was larger than <laughs> the Congolese uh, budget. Uh, but we see Congolese civil society uh, showing the disparity uh, where the minerals are being exploited and the beneficiaries, where Dan Gertler, for example, has got uh, royalties coming in uh, from Glencore uh, valued at about $200,000 a day. Now, you juxtapose that uh, in terms of the exploiting of the minerals to uh, the Congolese, average Congolese, where according to the World Bank, uh, over almost 70% of Congolese live on less than $2 a day. So on the one hand, $200,000 a day by a mining magnet, and on the other hand, uh, less than $2 a day uh, to some 60 to 70 million Congolese the 100 million inhabitants. So that structural uh, element is still very much in place. Uh, a second, uh, which I won't get into too deeply because of uh, time, is uh, you can probably tell the logical outcome of, uh, of this is a, it's a neo-colonial state where uh, the politicians uh, may reign, and govern somewhat, uh, but the economic decisions uh, that affect people's lives are really driven by corporate forces. Uh, 
uh, or are corrupt uh, at, the, at its core, as I've laid out to you with, uh, with Glencore being sued for corruption at Congo, with uh, Dan Gertler being put on US sanctions list by the Treasury Department of the United States uh, for its corrupt practices. But a, a third element of Congo, which I think is uh, particularly more relevant for, for discussion is really vital. Uh, Congo uh, holds an exceptional space. Uh, it serves as the nexus of the climate crisis on the one hand and the green energy revolution or green energy transition on the other hand. Why did I, do I say that? Because Congo is a part of the second largest rainforest in the world, often referred to as the second lung, uh, the Congo Basin. And the Democratic Republic of Congo itself uh, accounts for 60% of the Congo Basin. Now, the Congo Basin uh, sequesters more carbon than all the tropical uh, rainforests in the world combined. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a central player when it comes to the question of battling uh, the climate crisis. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it is also a home to the largest tropical uh, peatlands in the world. Uh, in fact, uh, the peatlands contained in the Congo uh, account for about 20 years of U.S. pollution from the burning of fossil fuels. So when it comes to uh, the question of the climate crisis, uh, the Congo Basin and the indigenous communities uh, in the Congo play a critical role. And interestingly enough, uh, less than 1% of the funding that goes towards uh, climate mitigation gets to those local communities. So those communities, the indigenous leaders, indigenous communities who are best placed uh, to preserve and protect the rainforest are the least financed, least uh, 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 resourced. Uh, so uh, here it is again, you have uh, Congolese indigenous communities, Congolese uh, civil society uh, making demands uh, for greater support uh, for the preservation of uh, Congo Basin. Now, when it comes to green energy and transition, Congo looms large. It is a part of the copper belt that folks in, uh, laid out between uh, Congo and Zambia. And uh, it is home uh, to the largest uh, reserves of cobalt in the world, some 50, up to 50% of cobalt. Uh, it's uh, Congo's uh, reserves. Uh, it is the largest producer of cobalt, 70% uh, of the cobalt. Uh, produce uh, in the world comes out of the Congo. In fact, if you add up all of the countries in the world that produce cobalt, Congo uh, outstrips uh, all of them uh, combined. And with the acceleration of the demand for cobalt as a result of the transition to uh, electric uh, vehicles, uh, we see uh, that uh, that extractive process uh, is also um, accelerating. Unfortunately, uh, the Congolese people again. Uh, whether we're talking about in the artisanal mining sector, which accounts for about 20% of the production of uh, cobalt coming out of the, the Congo, uh, suffer tremendously uh, as a result of the extraction of cobalt. Uh, they, uh, a recent study uh, was published uh, coming out of uh, uh, the New NYU, uh, New York uh, University, and uh, the, Stern, the, Cent the Stern Center for Business and Human Rights, and uh, also uh, the Geneva School of Economics and Management is February 23. Uh, the title of the, of the study, and maybe I can put a link in later, is, is Cobalt Mining in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Addressing Root Causes of Human Rights Abuses. And it delves into uh, the details of the extent to which uh, the artisanal miners suffer. First, it lays out clearly, uh, contrary to what uh, multinational corporations uh, have articulated that the uh, artisanal mining cobalt and the industrial mining cobalt is indistin indistinguishable. You cannot really talk, uh, it's a non-starter to talk about separating uh, artisanal mining cobalt from the industrial mining. They're one and the same. And uh, the Skern uh, School of Business proposes the formalizing of the artisanal mining sector which is a solid pro proposal of itself, but unfortunately falls short in proposing open pit mining uh, as a part of the solution in terms of, uh, they, they figure that would mitigate uh, the artisanal miners from digging deep tunnels, exposing themselves to harsh 
uh, minerals and also uh, dangers from caving in of, of, the, uh, of the mines. Uh, but the open pit mining, as everyone probably on this uh, seminar know, that leaves uh, broad open uh, uh, the, the despoilation of the land uh, open to environmental degradation. Uh, so it's uh, not the optimum um, solution. So, if, so in the artisanal mining um, sector, which is crucial to the Congo, because uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Congolese are engaged in the artisanal, you know, artisanal mining sector, and millions of Congolese uh, benefit from artisanal mining. So it definitely has to be addressed, uh, uh, and formalization is certainly uh, an appropriate path uh, in that regard. And I'm going to bring it to a close. It's not only the artisanal mining that's a sector that's affected uh, by the cobalt exploit exploitation, but you also have the industrial mining uh, sector. And I point you to a, uh, uh, a study uh, recently done by Rights and Accountability in International Development. It's, it's entitled The Road to Ruin, where they look at the uh, uh, industrial mining sector and its impact on the, on the workers. And what they find is, that uh, the workers uh, in the artisan, the Congolese labor, uh, the workers, they don't earn a living wage. A living wage is about $400 a month. Uh, the minimum, uh, the study says the minimum remuneration to afford a, a decent standard of living, they don't even get that. Uh, it says uh, about 63% uh, of the, the workers in, in, in interviewed found that uh, uh, they're, they're low wages, less living, uh, standard, bad working conditions, and exposed to health conditions. So I'll leave it there. I think I've got all my time. Just a little bit, sorry. Thank you, Maurice, for bringing those voices from the structural inequalities, published, um, suffering and being suffered in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, also due to the growing amount of cobalt. And thanks for explaining about the difference between artisan mining and uh, big scale or open sky mining and the different impacts that it generates on the countries. Finally, we're going to move to Mariana Walter, who's going to address something slightly different. To Mariana, she is a renowned ecologist and economist, we would like to ask about the project we're involved in. The entities were here. Could you please? Ligia Atlas, Observatory of the Depth of Globalization, please tell us your view. Thank you, Alphonse. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much. So, Pablo and Maurice for their presentations which have been very clear and which have touched on very important issues. My focus today will be a bit different. We'll be speaking about the Atlas of Environmental Justice. Environmental Justice, and I will tell you about the collaborative project that Alfonso was starting to explain. I will also invite you all who are listening to me now or who will later listen to the recording if you would like to be a part of this mapping of the environmental justice atlas, please contact us and become involved in this mapping process, which we hope will finish in October, November this year with the launching of a thematic map and a short report. So this is our presentation, but also this is our invitation to all of you. So you may become involved with our initiative. My name is Mariana. Walter, I'm a part of this group directing this environmental justice atlas that I will be presenting because maybe not the audience might not be familiarized with it. This is the image of the atlas. When you visit the website, which is www.atlas.org, an effort of social environmental issues or issues of environmental conflict, which was started through a project initiated by a group of research on 
political ecology, environmental conflicts, and organizations in the civil society from different countries in the world, the global south and also the, no the global north, concerned about the high environmental conflictivity. The lead jewel was the name of the project, which gave place to this map, which was developed not only through the research by committed researchers, but also through different collaborations with different local organizations, organizations, and other researchers, journalists, also students who were trying to make these environmental fights very visible, to visibilize them on the map. And I will now tell you what we define as a map case in our atlas, documenting different conflicts, presenting different categories that you can see. Conflicts have to do with uh, manual extraction, nuclear activities, construction materials, also managing of residues, agriculture, fossil fuels. Are you saying water management dams, infrastructures? We are also mass mapping a lot of conflicts which have to do with tourism and conservation. For example, um, India, we have a conservationist who has been working in conservation areas. We also were uh, map are mapping industrial conflicts. On the lower right, we can see two cases of thematic maps, which are collaborative and which have been developed by our atlas together with these other actors I mentioned before. What is this atlas useful for? Many of you might know this already, but I will point at some of the main uses of this atlas. It uh, allows to develop maps through some filters. We can see the high environmental conflict conflict levels at local or global levels or through different commodities or different teams. For example, if you want to see conflicts which have to do with cobalt, we can use that filter and see all those conflicts in the world involving specific metals such as timber, wood, or through specific companies. The Atlas is also allowing us to filter information according to the corporations, the companies that are carrying out conf conflict activities which have an effect on the communities. And each case will present documents which have to do with uh, the case documentaries, important laws that will allow us to understand the conflict reports each of those cases linked to the atlas shows a result, a result of a process of production where different people have documented and revised this atlas. Each case undergoes a short process of moderation where a group of the of researchers, a, 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 a group, some of us, go over the documentation to see whether the information is well documented, whether it's true, and we ourselves become involved in improving the presentation of the case uh, when reviewing it. And the final goal is to visualize uh, this environmental justice causes for each of the fights, but also to show the general trends of these conflict areas. For example, on the Atlas, we can see there's an increase in different parts of the world of conflicts which have to do with renewable energies. This is an activity which we might initially not think that it would, would create conflicts, but there's research and evidence being generated about these high conflict levels in terms of environment. In the case of Congo, Madagascar, and maybe Pablo Solon didn't mention it, but there is also the case in Bolivia of high tensions between the society and different projects or the development of mining projects and different kinds of projects, including lithium. What is a documented case in the 
E, J, Atlas. Why are there different cases? I will invite you to revise the Atlas for global environmental justice. Any other case can be documented in the Atlas if it is considered a case where there's a mobilization of local communities, social movements, which can also include the support to national and international networks against economic activities, such as the construction of infrastructures, or, and so including construction of infrastructures, other generation, contamination, residues where environmental impacts are a key element in the mobilization. What we are asking is that the environmental impacts will be an, a key element in this mobilization. And this is the definition used by the Justice Atlas, the Environmental Justice Atlas. I wanted to mention also some of the results of the research that took place based on all the data that has been documented by the Atlas in the last 10 years. For example, here we can see some of the results by an investigation which was published in 2020 in international, a prestigious international scientific magazine called Global Environmental Age Change, where 2,473 cases that the Atlas was displaying were analyzed. Right now, we have many more, 2,700 more in conflicts of environmental justice. And this trend that is maintained, the extraction of minerals and metals is the activity that generates most, the highest number of cases in our atlas, followed by, that was the 21% of them, and then followed by the 17%, which is fossil fuels and also, renewables are included in, in that. You can also look yourselves through the filters, how many conflicts by solar infrastructures or dams. You can also do a bit of research yourself and look up, browse in, your, in the atlas. And then the third would be intensive agriculture, such as palm, crops, um, conflicts by the use of soil. I wanted to point at this because the conversation that we're having in this webinar and this cycle, which has to do with this intensification of technologies in the energetic transition, but also in the economy in general, is highly dependent on minerals and metals that are extracted in the world, and precisely the most conflictive activities that are being documented in the atlas. This is also allowing us to show that extraction of mining, extraction of minerals and metals have a similar effect to what global witness usually reflects. Mining is one of the activities that is most highly linked to the murder of defenders, environmental defenders of environmental human rights in the world. And this is also pointed at uh, in our atlas, although this murdering and killing of activists is the most intensive case, intense case of violence. There's also criminalization and persecution cases of legal persecution and repression, mm -hmm. many other ways, many other forms of violence also documented in our atlas. Alfonso, were you going to say anything? We are also documenting the way the indigenous communities are receiving the highest amounts of violence in those conflicts not involving indigenous communities. And this is also identified and displayed in the Atlas. The Atlas is one of the forums we have to work and disseminate information generated by us through the building of these collaborative maps. This one here, for example, is a map that was developed in 2021 with Mining Watch Canada and a network of about 550 researchers, actors from the communities, 
and the organizations which who were concerned about, about the advance of mining in the context of the energetic transition. So we came up with this map where we document how the advance of the board of mining involved graphite and lithium mining in areas of high ecological value, also in areas where indigenous communities were living, uh, inhabited by indigenous communities, and also producing tensions in areas of indigenous heritage areas. Right now, we're working on a global action, as Alphonse was once saying, where ATLAS, or the GCRAAD, and Institute for Policy Studies, together with them, were looking to document different conflicts documented to the mining extraction and processing and recycling of rare earths. And we are processing different cases. I don't have the results right now to present to you, but I did want to briefly maybe point out that rare earths are not very well known, but they are fundamental elements. As we were hearing from Madagascar for the production of different um, electronic devices such as mobile phones, they are not so well known, but we wanted to document. Excuse me, Mariana, we are running out of time. Sorry, I'm almost over. Just two sentences and I, I will be done. Just to point out that most extraction refining has takes place in China. There's a strong advance of projects and extractive pressure in all around the world to avoid the dependence of what is being refined and extracted in China. Through this collaborative mapping procedure, we are documenting different cases, such as the ones you can see in the pictures here with complex linked with rare arts in China, Myanmar. In China is where most of the cases are placed, but there are also cases in Chile, Africa. So I was saying Latin America and also in Europe when there's an increase in the extractive pressure. We find ourselves in this process of identifying cases and local groups that are mobilizing with projects around rare earth and minerals so that we can make them visible on the global atlas so we can make this together so that we can contribute to the challenge of this dependence of different technologies which are highly, highly depending on these rare earths. So my final remark would be an invitation to you all to join the Rare Elements Collaborative Mapping and to join us with your cases. If you have any cases, please contribute with your cases for our Environmental Justice Atlas. If you have any doubts, please contact me with any doubts or questions you may have. Thank you. Alphonse. Thanks, Mariana. We have a second round plan. And I'll now try looking at the questions. Some have already been answered, and some have been answered in the chat. But uh, maybe some of the other panelists haven't seen this. And I'd like to go through them again. There's one thing, I'll read them in the language in which they have been written, right? And then interpreters will do some magic. And for instance, there is a question from America Sai saying, what is the difference between reserves and resources? Or what is the difference between the resources in Bolivia and reserves in Chile. I'll just read out all of the questions and then I guess this first question is addressed to Pablo. The second is also for Bolivia and Pablo answers this question in writing, but I'm sure he can go into. Less impacting technology to extract lithium and what are the specifically uh, the impacts expected? 
uh, that Fielo. Y Fielo también pregunta, is there any producers associations possible to create so that it can impose the less environmental impacting technology on all countries so that the contamination can be minimal? Then Alex is asking, this is a question that could be for any of the panelists. Alex is asking, in your opinion, what do you think multilateral development banks can finance um, any kind of uh, projects in the extractive industry? Is it is a question. So do you think multilateral development banks can finance any, any kind of projects in the, in the extractive industry? not at all without causing harm versus under some uh, set of conditions. So, sorry, Said is saying, how can we rethink the necessity and the problems to extract lithium in Bolivia from the perspective of a neo-colonial infrastructure and the ideology of the progress implanted in Latin America? I think we'll leave that question for the second round when we're looking at alternatives and on the questions that i read out to you maurice Ro, Zo, oh, pablo would you like to answer any of them you can feel free to turn on your microphone and if you like and answer the questions i think pablo has a lot more <laughs> questions but i just want to uh, to pick up on the question about the financing from the multilateral development banks. Unfortunately, uh, from, from, my, from what I know, it is only recently that uh, multilateral development banks have stopped to finance harmful, uh, I mean, projects uh, that are um, harmful for the environment as well as for the, the communities. Um, I have I have supported um, women affected by um, 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 coal fired power plant in Senegal, uh, which was financed by the African Development Bank, which is, um, as we all know, um the subsidiary of the world of um, of the world bank so there are also um different uh, very uh controversial projects uh in the mining sector that have been financed by european banks as well as not only in the mining sector but even in the agricultural sector so i'm not sure that um, all of them actually um, stick to um, the desirable standards in terms of which kind of projects can be uh, can be funded. But um, it would be interesting to do something about that. Maurice, Pablo, would any of you like to answer the question? Sure, I'd like to respond a little bit to the financing part. What, what we have seen is with the multilateral institutions, uh, they're usually on the side of the, the corporations and the projects that they, uh, they finance uh, uh, wind up uh, being to the disadvantage of the local population. Uh, and uh, in a lot of instances, a number of instances, the, uh, uh, the government to sell. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, institutions like the International Finance Corporation uh, which is the sister uh, organization of the, the World Bank, uh, they themselves are vested uh, in certain mining concessions in the Congo itself. So they have an interest on the private sector um, side. And you put this in the context, uh, we talk about, uh, I shared with you in the presentation that one of the um, key structural factors around the Congo is that it's a neo, for all intents and purposes, a neo-colonial state. Uh, so the coming out of the conflict in the 2000s in the Congo, the mining laws, the mining laws that govern the country were written by the World Bank and they were written in the interests of the corporations. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to, um, uh, to see uh, 
you know, examples uh, where those multilateral institutions are engaged in investing in a way that accrues to the benefit of the, the local population. And they inject themselves in a, uh, uh, even in a geopolitical context, um, because the, the biggest deal, uh, one of the largest, if not the biggest deal in the Congo, is between the Chinese uh, government and corporations and the Congolese government. Uh, and under the Joseph Kabila uh, uh, government in uh, 2009 or so, when uh, there was a $10 billion um, uh, infrastructure for raw materials swap deal that was put on the table between the Chinese uh, uh, government and the DRC government. At the time, the Congolese government uh, owed about $11 billion in debt to primarily to European and US private lending entities. Uh, and the Congolese government was seeking uh, $600 million in uh, uh, grants uh, and loans to the Congolese government so it could operate. Uh, the World Bank did not um, look kindly on the deal between China and the, uh, and the Congolese government. So it basically forced the Congolese government to renegotiate the deal and held out that if they didn't renegotiate the deal, the $11 billion debt wouldn't be retired, the $600 million wouldn't be delivered, and the Chinese government uh, didn't take too kindly to it, uh, basically said that uh, the, the multilateral institutions, uh, World Bank, was holding the Congolese government hostage and basically blackmailing. So uh, either the level of investment, uh, the type of projects that they invest in, and, and I'll get into some of that in the prescriptions, uh, especially when we're talking about energy and, and the Inga projects that we see that are being developed on the Congo River and the World Bank being party uh, to, to some of those. Uh, those um, local, uh, the local impact has not been to the benefit of the, uh, of the population. Well, I could answer some of the questions, but when it comes to looking for alternatives, what went wrong? I mean, I think the alternative that they started developing in Bolivia in 2008 was going along the right way. And that is having control over natural resources, I'd say, is a fundamental condition to come up with an alternative. Having things managed nationally is positive, added value, and having social participation in this state ownership, consultation, harmony with nature, having environmental impact assessments, uh, all good. But the proposal in Bolivia didn't work. Why not? Well, I think for various reasons. One is because I think there was a problem when it came to control of technologies and our government totally ignored all of the complexity hiding behind the production of lithium carbonate batteries and cathodic materials. The pro process was much more complex than we imagined in 2008. The value chains controlling this were not going to support a process that went against their logic of trying to gain control over natural resources. But uh, to this, we must add an internal factor as well, and that is the power ended up capturing those leaders from social movements that made it into the government. So the dominant logic wasn't to come up with environmental impact assessments or guaranteeing social participation. They were rather looking at how they could yield results as quickly as possible. And in doing that, they made a whole series of mistakes. I think the third serious problem and the most important of them all is that the government lost the ability to uh, so social organizations lost the ability to self-manage. I think we cannot build an alternative in our countries unless we have strong social organizations that can be self-managed and come up with creative solutions. I think that is what's most complicated today. I mean, we have to 
deal with the direct extraction of lithium now with a weaker social fabric and in a much more complex situation. And to conclude, I'd say that when we talk about alternatives, very often we talk in general terms, but I think alternatives have to be locally rooted. They have to be specific and have to bear in mind what is happening in each of the realities and have to take into consideration many aspects, the environmental, yes, but also the political, social, economic, and cultural factors must be taken into account. And I think that if we want to come, if these alternatives, these local alternatives can go hand in hand with actions in the global north, that would be fundamental. Not just due diligence in the global north or asking for uh, environmental standards from companies working, extracting natural resources in our country, but calling for structural changes in demand patterns in the north. It, we will never, uh, for instance, though, the lithium supply will never be able to cover for a change of all of the vehicles in the world to electric vehicles. It's impossible. So we'll have to think of structural changes in the Sorry, that was just for 30 seconds, the mute, mute mic's muted. I was saying that changes must happen not only in due diligence measures and to comply with raw material extraction standards in the global south, there must also be structural changes in the demand for these resources in the global north. It's essential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. As you already went into discussing alternatives, we will take the two remaining questions in the Q&A box, and to them we'll add some questions that we had prepared for this final round to talk about what Pablo already mentioned, and that is to discuss alternatives, alternatives uh, for this green digital transformation. And we wanted to ask Zoe and Maurice, and I think Pablo's already answered, we want to ask you what could be an alternative in Madagascar and what could be an eco-feminist alternative for Africa. And for Maurice, I'd like to ask you what could be an alternative for the people of DRC. And I'd add these two other questions that are in the Q&A box, which are most broader, longer questions to answer. I'll try summarizing them in case you want to respond to those questions when you give your answer on possible alternatives. For instance, Said is saying, how can we repeat the necessity and the process to extract lithium? But we could talk of lithium or cobalt or rare earth in Bolivia from the perspective of neo-colonial infrastructure and the global geo process in Latin America, from whom is the dream of modernity? Dan is also saying, there's a strategy for any of uh, your cases going forward to mitigate or stop altogether European, Chinese, etc., to carry out the activities mentioned in a capitalistic manner that seems to be all about running like head like chickens instead of deploying a, a plan of future. So the idea is that there should be planning and how do we understand this transition should be and revisit the very same idea of needs. We're also asking Pablo if he identified any interesting proposals in the uh, new cycle of progressive movements in Latin America. I don't know if Pablo or Maurice or uh, if you would like to add anything for this final round before closing. Whoever would like to take the floor first, feel free to do so. I think um, the speaking about the the possible alternatives for madagascar i think 
uh, and I agree with uh, with Pablo on that. I think that um, we need to shift uh, from uh, the focus uh, on the new colonial model uh, of uh, Madagascar's uh, primary insertion into the, the global economy and value chains. We have been um, for most of our economic history, providers of cheap uh, raw materials only. So we need to, to shift from that and uh, focus on energy sovereignty and addressing the energy poverty in Madagascar instead of trying to respond to demands for the energy transition needs of our for more colonial powers. So this requires, uh, first of all, putting an end to the prevailing extractivist development model that we have now in the country, and as well as the politics of sacrifice from our so-called development partners. Um, and uh, I think we also need to do a lot of work internally in terms of uh, overcoming the, the, the syndrome of the resource curse, because that's what we have. I do agree with you, Pablo, that very, very, there has to be some kind of national control over uh, the criti critical uh, um, and strategic resources. But um, if the national control uh, comes in the form of uh, predatory practices and corruption, then uh, that's not a solution. Um, we also need, uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I agree, I tend to agree with, you, with most of your points, actually. I think that, uh, the exploitation of strategic mineral resources and uh, responding to the energy needs must be based on the local and regional priorities. Um, with the free informed prior and ongoing concept of the affected communities. And um, I also think that the development of renewable energy in Madagascar, as well as uh, as well as in um, in internationally, uh, must go in parallel with a gradual reduction of the exploitation of um, of fossil fuels. We 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 actually for, I want to I want to talk a little bit about that because we have very important reserves of gas in Madagascar. But we are told by, um, I mean, the World Bank, the IMF, and other uh, so-called development partners that we should not, um, we should not, um, we should not exploit our gas reserves because, uh, because of the the Paris Agreement on uh, on the reduction of the use of fossil fuels. But uh, I think why 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 then if we we are we are told that we cannot exploit our gas reserves for our own internal needs? No one is saying to exam for example to the to Saudi Arabia to stop exploiting oil, or I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I think. Um, any kind of uh, alternative must be carefully contextualized uh, within the context of the political, social, and uh, and uh, and geopolitical context. Um, from an ecofeminist perspective, we, as ecofeminists, um, think that. Um, we must ensure uh, truly sustainable ways of living in harmony with nature. And that would include the following ele elements in terms of the energy transition. We must focus on energy sovereignty and democracy. 
through a sustainable and decentralized collective forms of renewable energy um, under the control of communities and specifically women. We must focus on small scale, low impact forms of extraction under collective um, control and ownership again, and subject to local and regional priorities. We must have participatory inclusive democracy at all levels of decision making about the energy transition. This is not something that has to be decided solely by government. Um, and uh, it must also recognize women's central role and their different needs in terms of uh, energy production. And um, yeah, and of course, uh, it is totally required that uh, the full and ongoing consent by affected communities and women in particular uh, must be uh, secured uh, with respect to the energy transition. Um, yeah, I think I have responded to the other questions in the, in the was it in the chat or in the Q&A? Uh, hey. Somehow. Gracias, so. Muchas gracias. Um, thanks a lot, merci beaucoup. Um, Maurice, por, please. If you wish to, you have to. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, Pablo's response uh, is a ideal segue uh, to the question of alternatives uh, as it relates to uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, Friends of the Congo at the moment uh, is in the process of uh, gathering uh, alternatives uh, coming out of the the Congo in particular, and the Congo Basin in, in general, um, through uh, will ultimately be made available through film uh, as we uh, visit different communities throughout the Congo itself. And uh, we're in the process of visiting different local communities throughout the Congo uh, Basin. And one of the, the guiding principles uh, that uh, really speaks to an alternative uh, comes out of the traditional leaders uh, among the uh, Topoke people. They're in the Isangi district of the Democratic uh, Republic of the, of the Congo, right in the heart of the, uh, of the rainforest. And they proffered uh, this principle of uh, Basanja, uh, spell that uh, B A S A N D J A. Uh, Basanja uh, in the lo is a local traditional code of conduct that governs the management and care of the forest, uh, the waters, and the environment as a whole. So, uh, key to the alternative is a philosophical foundation that indigenous communities are saying we're going to present to the world which is in direct contradistinction to the global north uh, principles of exploitation and plunder of the resources. So within that framework, you find uh, a series of examples um, throughout the, the Congo, um, agroecology examples that are taking place at the, the foot of the volcanic mo mountains in, in Goma, uh, in the mining sector in Lumata, uh, you have uh, Congolese women who are uh, growing uh, medicinal plants in the form of artemisia plants and uh, developing uh, uh, climate centers uh, that would look to channel uh, activity from the mining sector into the agricultural sector. This is not um, widely known, but uh, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has the agricultural capacity to feed 2 billion people if it's fully realized. That's twice the population of the African continent and about in the global population up to 2050. So,
So there are alternatives being developed in different parts of the country, uh, which we're documenting. And as I said, I will share uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a film that we're in the process of, uh, of producing. But in a, in a, in a specific, uh, uh, some specific examples in terms of uh, energy and uh, the promotion of, uh, of green energy, uh, we, uh, we see in the, in the DRC where uh, local energy consumption or access to electricity by the Congolese are at the level of 13%, right? And uh, in a country that has uh, low cost and accessible wind and solar pot potential uh, that really you know, outstrip and surpasses uh, the dam projects that, that, are, that are currently in place. And the dam projects are primarily on the Congo River uh, in the west of the country, the, the Inga, different Inga, the Inga, Inga Dam projects uh, as being, uh, that are being um, pursued. And uh, the DRC can harness uh, its considerable renewable energy uh, potential to power the country faster and more affordably than currently planned projects like we see on the Inga, the Inga 3 dam that provides energy for DRC and even down to, um, to, to, South, to South Africa. Uh, so uh, on the philosophical level, uh, we see the DRC and the Congo Basin offering a philosophical alternative, uh, which is uh, much in alignment uh, with uh, uh, a remarkable speech that was given by the president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, at the UN in 2022, uh, which speaks to some of what uh, uh, Pablo was talking about, how there has to be a fundamental change in the global north in terms of its con consumption patterns and its, uh, and its, and its priorities. Uh, and uh, there's a, a recent study that was done in January by the University of California, Davis, uh, where it's entitled um, Achieving Zero Emissions with More Mobility and Less Mining, uh, which is worth referencing to see how the Global North is looking at changing its uh, patterns, its consumption patterns, its living patterns, uh, as a, a way of uh, combating uh, not only the climate crisis, but also uh, reducing the necessity for the extractive, uh, extractive process. Uh, so uh, uh, back to the Congo, though, the, uh, I'll share another study that was done by International Rivers that look at these different renewable alternatives uh, that's grounded in wind and solar, uh, which is uh, really the practical energy alternatives uh, and uh, how can I say most uh, reasonable and sensible that we, we can have uh, coming out of the Democratic Republic of Congo, seeing that it's uh, especially in the, uh, when we speak of uh, solar in the Southern part of the, of the Congo going into the, uh, into the, into the Katanga region and just uh, enormous potential, solar potential there. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the wind potential is also uh, quite tremendous. So those are the uh, two practical uh, renewable alternatives uh, that we see uh, the DRC can be really a, a leader in. And I'll share the study that's done by International Rivers that go into far more detail uh, about uh, uh, the renewable alternatives uh, through wind and solar, uh, the, how much less it costs, uh, the, of course, the less of the impact on the environment, and, and certainly uh, producing more energy, uh, not only for the Congo, but uh, uh, for its, uh, its, uh, its neighbors as well, and those that it's already uh, sending electricity to countries like, uh, like South Africa. Thank you, Maurice. We don't have much time. Maybe one last opinion. Very quickly. I wanted to refer to another part that has nothing to do with lithium. It has to do more with mining and the Amazonia. The presidents of the Amazonia will gather and will meet their associations in Peru, Brazil, Colombia. What is the position they should have for mining? Our position, our 
joint position is there can be no mining in the Amazonia, not even artisan mining. Mm. Every mining in the Amazonia will cause a devastating impact on the area, not only environmental health, but also on human health. We need a transition plan in order to come out of the mining in the next five years. In the Amazonia, we want to avoid the non-return point to which we are, that we are reaching in the Amazonia. So as Alex was saying, the president have been asked not to further finance any mining activities in the Amazonia because currently what is being received in terms of bank financing is much more than what the Amazonia is receiving for the preservation of the biodiversity of the area. I will conclude by saying that this will mean that the alternatives need to be seen in each situation, in each specific situation. We cannot have the same situation in the Bolivia case. For example, um, each transition should move forward according to the different scenarios. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Pablo. Mariana, we have two more minutes. Maybe we can, you can say a concluding word. Many important things have been said already. I just wanted to mention along the lines of what Maurice was saying that when environmental justice conflicts are being analyzed, such as in our atlas. It is not only about visibilizing this infinite growing model and this energetic transition model, but these are spaces for reflecting on different ways of protecting different existences, different ways of thinking to create spaces for sustainable and just systems. Conflicts have led many communities to ask themselves what are their energetic needs, which of them are which of them are energetic or which others have other sources. We have technology to provide for those technology that will not necessarily mean more solar panels or more wind mills. There are other ways of managing the resources which are sustainable. So maybe we should decolonize the debate and thinking about the energetic transition should maybe give place to energetic transitions or different models in plural and not just one plural, not one model because there are different contexts and different situations. So we can maybe deconstruct the hegemonic discourse that is trying to describe one only scenario and one only set of technologies that might come up with a solution. So I think this discussion has been going on for a long time in the social movement spaces, but it is important that decisions are being made jointly bearing in mind the current impacts and the future impacts on the Amazonian in some regions. Amazonia has started to be an emitting focus of carbon dioxide, of carbon, instead of being a reducer of CO2, the communities that have not been the key actors in the big emissions during the climate crisis are currently those that are facing the big social environmental problems because of the advance of this extractivism and these new technologies which is putting this ecosystem and their community and these communities at risk. Thank you, then. It has been a very useful and interesting panel today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, thank you very much. Diana, thank you, Pablo, Maurice, and Zoe. So as Mariana said, we will stay with the plurals. There's no homogenization of a proposition. There is no one proposal for a green transition. There are different solutions according to the different situations in different territories. So there's a proposal of transition of a technological base. But as Pablo, Mauricio, Zo, and Mariana were saying that we must question this transition. It is not bad to question it. 
and talk and also discuss alternatives to the northern approach and developing strategies in networking and collaboration with the South so that this transition will be just from a gender perspective, from an environmental perspective, from an economic perspective, and also if that's what I think will also have the elements of historical reparation towards the peoples and of the global south. I will like to I would like to close now this webinar about the video and materials. You will find it in the YouTube channel of the Observatory del Delta de la Globalización, the Observatory for the Depth of Globalization. And I it's I'm going to share this in the chat. The video of today's seminar will be on YouTube channel. And then next Monday, same time, 5:30 p.m. Central Europe time. So 22nd May, we'll have a second webinar. It will be focusing on hydrogen as a major play in the energy transition. And then again, uh, we will have a third session, the 1st of June, space for care and feminism in this transition. These will are the three webinars. So webinar three on June 1st, also same first same time for 30 to 7 p.m. Is there room for care and feminism and nutrition? These are the webinars we are proposing. Thank you to Zoe, Maurice, Mariana, Pablo for being here today. Thank you to the interpreters or colleagues who have helped us understand each other from the diversity of some of the languages. Thank you to our colleagues from the Observatory of the Web Globalization. Luna and Magda, who are here next to me, they have been at the backstage of the webinar so that we were able to have this common space today. And so we'll see you in our next webinar next week. Thank you very much. See you next Monday.